Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the MTG Goldfish Podcast, episode 144, your weekly podcast covering everything Magic the Gathering related. You can find us on Google Play, iTunes, mtggoldfish.com, and now on YouTube. No Richard this week. Richard is on vacation for the next two weeks, so it's just Seth and I. Seth, our resident jank brewer and all-around content creator. What's up, Seth? Uh, how's it going, Chaz? I'm doing well. Uh, Chaz is always uh, focusing on the financial aspect and all-around content for Magic the Gathering. It's just you and me, buddy. We have a lot of fish mail, so that's that's good. But also, we wanted to hone in on Standard. Uh, Standard is very much in flux with another uh, kind of higher-end um, tournament going on in Nationals. We're only going to really focus on the U.S. Nationals because that's pretty much the list that we have to work with uh, that's right in front of us. Um, that'll bring us to, you know, we'll, we'll talk about just various topics. Very briefly, we'll talk about uh, the dual deck, Goblins vs. Merfolk. We have the lists that were previewed on a French site. So we'll talk about that really quickly. And then, like I said, yeah, we have a ton of fish mail, so we wanted to leave enough time for that. So, yeah, Seth, uh, let's just fire it off. Uh, what what do you think of Nationals? I mean, seems like we're constantly in flux week in and week out, uh, but it, it definitely has solidified that Ramonet Red and Energy are the decks to beat, and it's not close. Like, those two are the main two pillars of the format, and then everything else just kind of falls into place. But, I mean, there's a lot of decks that are seeing success. It's not like there's no room for innovation or there's just... It's kind of looking like an old standard set where it was just a couple decks, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, so first off, it's awesome they brought Nationals back. I think it was really cool this weekend to see how hyped players were. You could tell that players care about this tournament a lot more than just, like, a random GP or something. There was a lot on the line as far as, like, pride and representing your country. So I think that's really awesome. Even beyond the deck list, good job, Wizards, bringing back Nationals. Really good decision. As far as the decks... It's nice to see that new things are still happening, even in a world where I think out of the top 16 at U.S. Nationals, nine decks were energy decks, either Saltai or Teamer, uh, or Four Color as well. So, like, more than half of the top 16 was energy, but we're still seeing other decks being able to compete, and maybe our hope for a diverse standard is that Ramanop Red and Teamer Energy just kind of keep turning their sights on each other to take down the other top deck, and that weakens them against kind of some weird rogue strategies. Like, the most exciting deck to come out of it was definitely Red-White Approach, which yeah. uh, was something no one had on their radar, but we also saw Blue-Black Control put a couple, couple copies into the top eight, actually take down the whole tournament. Tokens finally broke out with a top eight finish in the paper world. So we, uh, Mardu Vehicles made a comeback, making top four. So we did see new things, even in this world, where energy, I think energy is clearly number one, and Ramen on Bread is probably right on its tail at number two, but we still saw stuff that was able to compete and make the top eight even in that meta game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and just further, you know, commenting on what you said about Nationals, I think this needed to be the first, you know, they needed to switch the schedule. I think this needed to be the first uh, kind of more major tournament that kicked off Ixalan standard. That's just first and foremost. I don't know if you agree, but uh, it definitely felt more exciting to watch this and all the different storylines than a very... Not that there wasn't, not that the tournament was bad or anything like that. Really great magic was being played, and it was kind of condensed to, well, a lot of the best players. Uh, but I think that kind of needed to come second. Yeah, I think having Nationals or the Pro Tour first would have been much better than having Worlds first. Yeah, in terms of the decklist, yeah, it, it definitely seems like, like I said before, Teamer Energy and even Rabinette Brad are kind of the decks to beat. But you're right. I mean, there's still innovation. This blue, this blue, uh, or sorry, red white approach list that is actually seeing some, uh, success even now that, you know, the deck kind of broke out at nationals. I, I saw a few tweets of people playing this deck. Kenji, I, I saw a tweet by, by Kenji playing this red white, um, approach list. And it definitely seemed like a great innovation to attack this metagame. So I'm hopeful. I know a lot of people are already kind of being pessimistic about this, but, uh, it def there, there's a lot of tools in this format that are obviously being used to uh, attack the different uh, decks that are doing that well in, in Team or Energy and Red. So you see a, a ton of different flavors of tokens. Blue-Black Control still really strong, took down the tournament. Uh, the gift list, even in the SCG Classic, uh, it was modern this weekend, but there was also an SCG Classic in Charlotte. That took down that tournament. 
So there's a lot of different things going on. I, I think that's great. I mean, we like to all kind of focus on the negatives here, but there's a lot of different decks to be played, and I think that's it's pretty healthy, um, barring, you know, being so focused on Scarab God and Energy and Ramen Epic. I think the big question is going to be the Pro Tour. I think that's yep. going to do a lot to determine people's perception of the format. Like, if we go into the Pro Tour and it's 60%, 70% energy versus ramen on bread, I think that's going to really solidify the perception that that's what the format's about. But on the other hand, if we go to the Pro Tour and we're seeing Red White Approach, we're seeing Tokens List, we're seeing all this other stuff that's now starting to show up, then I think people are going to be pretty happy with the format. So fingers crossed for the Pro Tour. I think that's going to really determine people's mood about Standard heading into Rivals of Ixalan. Well, I still, I mean, it, if Pro Tour ends up being like these last couple of tournaments where you know, there's it's a lot of energy in red, but there's still other decks that compete. I think people are still kind of okay with that. I think if it looks like these last couple tournaments, I agree. But if it looks like Worlds, I think that's where we'll have a problem. If it's like, you know, 10, yeah. 10 Ramen on Bread, 10 Energy, a couple control decks, and that's it, then I think people will be disappointed. Yeah, and I, and I mean, rightfully so. But um, I, I really love the, the red-white approach list. I think that's a really awesome innovation to kind of um, attack what has been pretty uh, one-sided affair in, in Ramonet Red and Energy. And finally, the tokens list. And there's a lot of different flavors of tokens list from Abzan to even this Esper version with Jace now, Seth. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't like know. the Esper version. I really love the Esper version. And plus so, you get Scarab God, so. <laughs> you get Scarab God, that's for sure. And I mean, people are turning to Crested Sunmare, but I don't. I, I think that could just be four copies of Scarab God. The I don't other. know why. Like, it just kind of feels like, why even play the Sun Mare? I mean, I get it, but it's easy to trigger the Sun Mare, and it can get out of control very quickly. So I can see why people are choosing to play that, but I don't know. It just kind of feels like scary. The craziest list out of any of the tournaments was definitely the Mono White Vampire Monument <laughs> deck that took 16th at the Classic. This deck... I can't figure out how it won. Did you see that list, Jazz? I, I, Dustborn Sky Marcher, Bishop Soldier. How did they get top 16 with this? Were there 16 I, players, maybe, at the classic? I, I don't know. I, I don't think there were 16 players, but sometimes when you're just not prepared for these types of decks, I mean, it just, they get you, you know? But I, I just, I, Legion Conquistador and Bishop Soldier. I mean, some of these are like even questionable. In draft so i i don't <laughs> maybe something's there i don't know but it, it kind of yeah. feels like this would be just as good if you were just playing like actually good white creatures like good like good cards in that color like where's the the oh what's the one with uh legion uh what's the one from amonkhet the two mana three one it turns to a four four when you exert it uh glory bound initiate like where's the glory bound initiate and stuff like that like, really? Bishop Soldier? <laughs> Bishop Soldier over Glory Bounds Initiate. That's, that's, uh, pretty bold. Yeah. I, I mean, it's definitely sweet, and it's, like, super cheap. I think the deck's, like, 65 bucks, so maybe, <laughs> at least, maybe it's a cool, like, budget option for people, but I don't know. You, you have impressive. to, you have to investigate this. You have to investigate this. This has to yeah. be, this has to get, like, a feature of budget magic. Yeah, I might have to budget magic this one up because this, this, it is this super definitely. spicy. You have to play this. Although Adanto Vanguard is probably the best card in the deck. That card is really sweet. It is pretty sweet, but it looks funny compared to Glory Bound Initiate. <laughs> it does. It definitely does. But oh, I don't know. I mean, Oketra's Monument can fly. I guess it can just win games. I don't know. It's just like you could pretty much play it. Yeah, I mean, if you make enough tokens, you can kill people. So I guess it, as long as you're triggering your monument, maybe it doesn't matter so much what you're triggering it with. But right. uh, I don't know. So, Chaz, what is your overall 1 to 10 feelings on Standard right now? Heading into a Pro Tour in like two weeks, I think, three weeks, something like that. Where's your confidence level? I believe it's November, the first week in November. I believe so, November 4th through 6th or something. If you asked me before Worlds, I would probably be like a lukewarm like five or six. But but Nationals definitely gave me more of a more of kind of hope that there's there's definitely more out there. So I'm I'm trending maybe to like 
the high sevens eight range that uh, this can end up still being a really good standard, um, despite you know just how good energy and Ramanat red is. So I, I think national has definitely rekindled some of my confidence in this format. I think I'm on the same track with you, although my starting number is probably lower. After Worlds, I was probably like a maybe a three to four, and now yeah, I'm probably yeah. up to like five to six or something. But I think, just like you, this last weekend of Nationals did give me a lot of hope that I didn't necessarily have after the Worlds uh, metagame and how that looked. Yeah, and I mean, I also look a lot at the 5-0 list in, uh, on Moto, and I know that's not like hugely indicative of anything, but those are always really different, too. So it kind of feels like there's still a lot to be extracted from there, and I think that needs to be, you know, that can still be translated to paper. So I, I guess that's why I was I started a little higher and trending a little higher than you, w- than you are right now. But, you know, because there was a huge standard PTQ as well. And, w- yes, there was a lot of Ramanat Red at the top. There was three at the top. But there was also Esper Gifts. There's Tokens, Blue Black Control. Uh, there was another, like, four-color uh, gift list. So there was, like, a lot of things going on. Yeah, I mean, that's true. We are still seeing different stuff that's apparently good enough to compete. I'm not sure if it's any of these things will be good enough to unseat a deck like Team or Energy is the best deck in the format, but I don't think we need that to happen. All we need is, like, a couple more lists that are good enough to compete with those lists even if team energy is going to be the best deck like as long as we have you know a small group a handful of lists that give you a shot in a metagame that's full of team or energy and ramen on bread then we can have a pretty good standard even with ramen on bread and team or energy being the best decks i mean we have rivals of Ixalan still to go so i think a lot can still be you know changing uh even after that there's there's not like a huge gap of time um until rivals so uh, we and get I mean, kind of another more support fingers, for the tribes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Fingers crossed that we get enough dinosaurs and pirates that those decks move from kind of like very fringe right now to maybe at least being like tier two or something where we're seeing them show up at tournaments. And hopefully, I mean, I think that at least dinosaurs and pirates, I don't know about merfolk and vampires, uh, but at least dinosaurs and pirates feel like they're close enough that even with just one more small set, they might get over the hump and be able to compete. So, uh, with that being said, um, really quickly, there was a modern uh, open. Nothing really crazy other than this blue-green merfolk list by Alan Cummings in the in eighth place. I gotta say, the blue splash seems pretty awesome, and uh, Kumena Speaker and Merfolk Branch Walker are just aw- like awesome cards, so makes sense. Yeah, it's really interesting to see green catching on, but Kimana Speaker in specific really gives the Merfolk deck an aggressive one-drop that it didn't have. Like, Curse Catcher is a great card, but as far as beating your opponent down, it's not especially good at that. It's better at being disruptive than really being aggressive, so it almost feels like a more zoo-ish style of merfolk where you're looking to be really aggressive and kill your opponent quickly. One thing I'm wondering, you got 30 creatures. They're all under three mana. You're already splashing green. What about collected company in this list, Chaz? Like, is it, is there any merit to running collected company in this list? I think Aether Vial just is, is enough. I mean, you, you don't really need many charges on it. It's pretty quick to power up and, I, I think if you're going to be playing Collected Company, you're going to play Collected Company and what that does well. Like, you're going to be playing those kind of very uh, toolbox slash um, combo decks. And I think Merfolk's just looking to just regurgitate creatures on the board. They're already really inexpensive, and uh, that's just not what Merfolk is about. I, I think it could work. I just don't. I just don't think you need to. Yeah, I and I think it's probably really hard to play Vile and Collected Company because they both kind of weaken each other. Yeah. So I think it would be one or the other, and maybe it's just that Ether Vile is just better in a deck like Merfolk in specific. You might be right. So yeah, just wanted to document that. Uh, we also have, I'm trying to pull up, I, I think you have it in front of you, Seth, the um, Merfolk list. Merfolk and Merfolk versus Goblins, the dual deck. So we got our new dual deck spoiled today uh, on a the Wizards French site. So found out that, I mean, 
as far as the recent dual decks go, it doesn't look too bad. So Merfolk kind of headliners Master of Waves as a big mythic. Also get Master of Pearl tried it as a lord. Harbinger tried, sees play in modern misdirection. Uh, Would have been more exciting before it was reprinted in Conspiracy, but still like a legacy playable card. And then as far as goblins, Warren Instigator is kind of the headliner. Got a Rabble Master, which has been ticking up thanks to the Frontier hype, actually, a little bit. Goblin Chieftain, uh, Crankle Mob Boss. So a lot of powerful tribe members, although... Only one ofs for the rares and mythics, like usual. So, what's your what's your thinking on these decks, Chaz? The dual decks are like really a hit or miss. I think after seeing enough of them that the tribal ones, like or you know, you get knights versus dragons. So I guess yeah, the tribal um, are often vastly better than the like generic named ones. I can't remember the last one. It was like Lavisa Cold Eyes and what was the other legend? I can't quote. Uh, uh, the storm one. Oh, uh, oh, geez. Um, oh, man. Oh, I can't the think of the card one. right now. I the can't. Uh, something. Uh, Joyra. 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 Yeah. There we go. It was like fierce verse, like quickness or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever they use these days, but those those are definitely letdowns. But these seem much better. I, I think if you were to crunch the numbers on this, I think there's probably maybe like. 40 ish dollars in here, something like that. I, I, I saw on Reddit that there was like on an optimized TCG player like cart, this was like $49 or something like that. So these these seem much more successful than their counterparts. And, and um, like I said, they're really hit or miss. This seems like a good one. So I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good one too. I think the tribal ones are naturally easier to build because you have this solid theme like oh you just put a bunch of good merfolk in the deck and you got a deck when with the kind of themeless ones or the looser themed ones we were talking about like the lavisa cold eye ones sometimes you got some weird card choices and the deck doesn't necessarily like flow that well together as compared to the tribal decks but i think it seems like a reasonable dual deck the decks look pretty fun the value is obviously there. Fifty dollars is a lot of value for a. I think they're nineteen ninety nine or something like that. MSRP, yeah. so good value for your money. Playable cards. Like one thing I do like is you could theoretically, and I don't know if it's worth it, but if you bought like four of these, you would actually come kind of close to like building a real modern deck. You'd have four Master Waves, four Master of Pearl Tridents, four Harbinger Tides. You're kind of on your way to building a real Merfolk deck. And the same with Goblins, like four Rabble Masters, four Chieftains, four Instigators. I think you could build like a semi-competitive version of each of those with just a few upgrades if you were willing to, you know, buy enough to get four of the key cards. Yeah, and that's why they're so much more successful, because they give you an actual base. And it just happens that these two tribes are kind of fringe playable in in a competitive format. When you have the other kind of generic like dual decks, it is hard to kind of form a base of like what are these decks going to do and then just throw in random cards. I mean, I can't even remember other than the two face cards a notable card in either of those decks. So, I think those are falling have been falling short for a little while, but on the flip side, the the tribal ones are really successful. And this is now going back, I mean, I can even remember, like, Knights vs. Dragons. That one was really good, even at the time, and still is. So, I think they have to kind of either normalize that both of them are pretty good, or bring up the, just kind of the generic dual deck up drastically. Because sometimes, I don't even know if we're even getting 20 bucks in that I in would, the box set. I would like to see them, with the more generic ones focus on maybe modern archetypes so almost like how these decks we were just talking about kind of gives you a base to build into a semi-competitive deck in modern you could technically do that with like affinity with tempered steel mem knights ornithopters almost like a kind of a hybrid between uh, the modern event decks obviously you can't go that far and give people like four inquisitions and stuff for 20 bucks but at least give people something to build towards. And I feel like that's what lacks from the generic ones. Like, yeah, you got this random pile of cards, but how do you go forward with that to build like a semi-real deck as a new player? You really can't, but you can with the tribal one. So I think that's what I would like to see. Do like dual deck affinity versus burn or something where at least 
you would give the players like some pathway forward to doing something with their deck once they move past the casual playing with my friends with these cards to like, oh, maybe I want to go to an F&M or something. Like, give them a chance to do that with the generic ones as well. Absolutely. And I, I mean, we've talked about this before, and Richard has kind of, you know, brought the the notion that these are for new players. And, and that's certainly true, and I think that still has to be kept in mind. But, I mean, this is a dual deck, too. This is not, like, totally outside the realm of a new player, and you still have the value there. Yeah, I'm sure tribes are easy to pick up, and they're on, kind of on theme with, like, Ixalan being released. But I think you could probably... There, there's more to be wanting on the uh, the other kind of generic dual deck side. Like I said, like you said, I mean, I, I don't think uh, Metalcraft uh, would have been that hard to pick up, or you know, something along those lines, or even Infect, or something, just anything where you can kind of get a base, and then you can bring that into either Standard or Modern or what have you. All right, uh, I think that brings us to Fishmail, Seth. We have a lot, so we wanted to leave enough time to answer them all. Uh, so every week you can send in your questions using the hashtag uh, MTG Fishmail, and we will try to answer them all on air. T underscore laser. Does buying more sealed product of a set increase or decrease EV, i.e. buying a case rather than buying a box, means EV plus? In theory, the EV is the same, uh, but if you buy more especially with like masterpiece sets, you can kind of account for variance somewhat where like if you buy one box, the odds of opening a masterpiece is not very high. If you buy a case, your odds of missing on a masterpiece is actually pretty low. So I guess that's the value of buying more is you kind of, the more you buy, the more correct the EV will become because you uh, even out for the natural variance of getting a bad box or a good box. So while the EV is the same, you can kind of overcome variance by buying more of a set uh mark de armand at uh masticon is it time have a limit of three times of a card in standard four times may oh so is it time to have a three card limit in standard four maybe two degenerate for such a small card pool? um the problem is is that we just had a major rotation uh i i don't i don't think we need to go to such drastic lengths but i, I think it's just compounded that we replaced a lot of cards leaving with just one set. Yeah. And, and it I, does happen. But I, I don't think we have to I don't think we have to go into the realm of limiting um, you know, play sets to three. I think that uh, I worry about the consistency issue. Like, yeah. I think you add more... We were just talking about variance with EV, but you add more variance to the game when you have less of a card. So I think that it might make the game more frustrating to play. So I don't know. I think I'm pretty happy with the four of limit, personally. Uh... Wei Wang at only Wei. Uh, if I'm butchering your names, I, I, I really apologize. Uh, <laughs> you guys said uh, Ixalan was weak. How does it compare to BFZ? Remember Seth's article? And this was an article, Seth, in uh, on October 27th, 2015. Battle for Zendikar, and this is <laughs> and and the this is all this always happens theory. I don't know if you remember this article. I, I'm Basically, actually looking it over right now. <laughs> but yeah, but actually, this was an article that you were talking about. Um, like Battle for Zendikar was less than like 10% of the total card pool in the Pro Tour. And it basically just boiled down to Gideon, Ally of Zendikar. And like I, Dispel and stuff. I feel like right now Ixalan is similar. Although I would want to wait until after the Pro Tour to really say too much. I think comparing Pro Tour to Pro Tour is a much better comparison point than comparing Pro Tour to Worlds. Because Worlds is so weird. But I do think... At first glance, I think that BFC and Ixalan are fairly comparable in terms of how much play they're seeing right away in their formats. If I if I was saying Ixalan was super weak, I don't I don't really remember. And if I have, then I apologize. But I always thought I was pretty optimistic for this set. And um, even looking back on BFZ, now that this is kind of right in front of me, uh, we've come a long way. And even like it feels like the design of these sets, and a lot has happened in the course of that time that I definitely feel like they've hit, hit their stride since they started. Uh, they really changed um, the block structure and the release structure. So, I mean, looking back on a set like Battle for Zendikar and even that entire block, I, I think they've really come a long way and have become more successful at creating these sets. And I, I don't even think Ixalan is that weak. I mean, it's, it's put forth a couple really great cards, um, a couple of archetypes are very i mean they're fringe but they're kind of right there so 
I don't think it's really that bad. And I, I don't think I ever really touted that it was that bad. And I will say one of my suggestions at the end of that article for upping the amount of players that would see would be to increase the playability or power level of the lower rarity slots like commons and uncommons and uh, which was something that was really lacking in Battle for Zendikar and it feels like they really did do that in Ixalan. Absolutely. Like the number of good commons and uncommons is probably the highest I remember. Duress, Lightning Strike, Spell Pierce, Charticors, uh, some of the, the Drover of the Mighty. There's a pretty big list of good commons and uncommons so I think it's also just like kind of what my article that we didn't actually end up talking about, but what my article yesterday was talking about, we have this like weird perfect storm of one set of Ixalan with it being a fairly parasitic set where you want these tribes to matter and that we just don't have quite enough support for the tribes to get there in standard combined with two sets of a very uh, parasitic mechanic and energy which is very strong right now so i think that that's maybe the biggest reason why ixalan hasn't taken off more is one set of ixalan's parasitic mechanics is not enough to overtake two sets of kaladesh's yeah. parasitic mechanic yeah, and Amon Ket is just kind of in the block, is just kind of in the space where it's just supporting everything, right? Just, yeah, it has that the gift stack that it's built around, but it didn't really focus on any one thing, right? It, it just really didn't feel like its mechanics were good enough to kind of build entire archetypes around. So it has that gifts list, which I'll keep referring to, but a lot of really support, it's basically a supporting cat. I just think Ixalan, I think Ixalan's great, it's just kind of overpowered by how good Kaladesh. So, and I think that's kind of something we said. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, your conclusions in that article, even back in 2015, Seth, and like I said, we've come a long way. I mean, not even just in Ixalan. We've had some really great, uh, even commons and uncommons in other sets as well. So they really upped the power level on a lot of different things and kind of, I guess, really changed and fixed their design philosophy in terms of what we need a lot of different answers because even back then we just didn't have answers for everything anything it was just we play a whole bunch of cards but pretty much haphazardly and with impunity and i think we've come a long way i i would actually say that i think ixlon is where roughly where we want magic sets to be yeah the problem isn't ixlon the problem is kaladash block was there was just so many mistakes as far as power level of individual cards, of mechanics as a whole. So I feel like the problem is not Ixalan. Ixalan is where we want the power level of sets to be, generally speaking. The problem is Kaladesh is just too good. I think if it was, if Kaladesh was toned down, we have Amon Kep block, I think we would have a really good standard. I mean, if, it's just really just energy. And point. I yeah, I mean, I feel like we still have potential to have a pretty good standard, even despite yeah. the the weakness yep. of standard being the energy is arguably just too good. Yeah, I and really despite that, we can still block. be good. Yeah, I'm a kind of black is actually a lot like Ixalan. I feel like that's another set that really is where we want sets to be, which that means we're talking about Amonka, Hour of Devastation, Ixalan. That's three sets in a row that I feel like really hit the mark in terms of power level. So if we can just wait it out for Kaladesh to rotate, I have really high hopes that we're just going to continue seeing things at this power level and standard is going to be super amazing. Yep. Definitely feels like they that's where they want MTG Arena to go. I mean, if they could probably start at Ixalan, I think they would. <laughs> like yeah. Going forward. Because they strung together a couple of really great sets, and I, I do agree. I, I think that's where sets need to be. Amonkhet, Hour, and Ixalan have been really great. And I and I, I personally enjoyed uh, them kind of designing uh, and kind of bringing scaling things back a bit to kind of even out the power level. Andrew McDonald, uh, a, at a Sterling MACD, Better than Solimity, White Sideboard Tech versus em Energy. Tokatali on... Oh, I'm butchering this. Honor <laughs> Tukotli, Guard? Tukatli, I think. Tukatli Honor Guard. There we go. Tukatli Honor Guard. Uh, I Actually, don't really that's see... Pretty, that's not bad. Yeah. I mean, I guess it stops Rogue Refiner. It stops other Enter the Battlefield energy triggers, which is good. The problem is Solimity is super hard to kill. There's a very limited number of cards in the standard that deal with enchantments. Cast out, Ixalan's Binding, the random Faraska from Abzan Tokens, when pretty much every deck can kill a 1-3 for 2. 
So it's while it does do a good job of shutting down some of the energy stuff, I feel like it'll just get fatal push, get harness lightning when Solemnity is more likely to stay on the battlefield. Uh, the Aldrazi processor at TM uh, Steuer, uh, why don't they run a GP style event in the same hall slash time as a PT? Would be great for fans. Didn't they used to do I, this, Chaz? I, 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 I think they did. Um, I thought there was a story about, stopped. oh, who was it? I think it was Paul Rietzel, maybe, that, like, yes, topped 8A a pro a, a GP while playing in the Pro Tour or something. Like, he yeah. thought he was going to drop from one of the events, but just kept winning and winning. It was, like, running back and forth, trying to finish a match real quick to get yeah, to the other this, event. Oh, I... I, I... Oh, this had to be a few years ago, right? I think it was the Callblade Pro Tour. I think it was Pro Tour Paris. Yeah, where Callblade oh, so that's broke a while out. ago now. But yes, they used to do this, and um, I I don't see I didn't hear anything super horrible about it. I don't know why it went away. Although maybe it's just logistically an, a nightmare. But I think that's something that would be pretty interesting to bring back. It could be cool to have a public event running alongside the Pro Tour, and that would. I mean, think of how big of an event that would be. You know all the pros are going to be there. Hopefully, I mean, make it an extra day. Have a Friday or a Thursday, I guess it would be, like GP Vegas, where you can meet and greet all the pros, get to all the fans, get to meet everyone. It would be a pretty cool event, even if they did it, like, once a year for one pro tour and had, like, a fan appreciation pro tour with events running alongside it. That would be a pretty cool event. I agree. Shadowhawk uh, at... I'm not even going to say this is a bunch of... <laughs> A-B... A- a- Hinov, Hinov Jane 87. Uh, when do the prices for the broken Ixalan flip cards get fixed? Been ages now. Really messed up uh, the uh-huh. M and S page, movers and shakers page. So yeah, I, I think they're referring to. I mean, I believe we've seen like growing right of Ixalan there, like for at least almost a week. I think the problem is the flip side is showing up as a its own card. So there's Growing Right of Itlamok and Itlamok Cradle of the Sun or whatever. It's two yeah. different cards. So I have to ask Richard about it. He's uh, not here today, but he would be the one. So I will definitely ask him about uh, getting that fixed. Sounds good. Uh, Gene Donati at JK Donati. Why did the Scarab God see any play before rotation? What makes it so good now? Well, I think I think the meta has shifted away from Gear Hulks. Uh, I, th- I thought that would be something that we saw with uh, rotation is that the gear hulks would pretty much just be the top end of every single deck um that could still happen uh we could see a shift but with a braid and all this stuff running around um and and these red decks and everything just being so aggressive um i I think the scarab god is just easier it's easier for the scarab god to take over a game um and it's in pretty much the strongest colors right now and it can be easily splashed for yeah i think it's like a combination of things and the gear hall uh and scarab god did actually start to catch on like a little bit towards the end of standard we started to see teamer energy splashing for it and whatnot so i think it took a little while for the power level to become really apparent but some good answers rotated like stasis snare was really heavily played it's a little harder to kill a scarab god now the answers are more expensive like for Asuka's contempt instead of stasis snare or cast out instead of stasis snare and it just got really good support printed hostage taker naturally works well with it search for his kanta mills cards over into your graveyard works really well in the blue black control shell so i think it's and also for Asuka's contempt his push deck towards playing black and if you're playing a Frasca's Contempt deck it's really easy to play the Scarab God and you really need something like Frasca's Contempt to answer Hazret to answer opposing Scarab Gods at this point so I think it's like just kind of a perfect storm of a bunch of little things that made Scarab God so powerful rather than one big thing that made it happen Homey G Music Ger- uh, Gerald Home or Home G Music I, if I'm butchering that I apologize what magic cards do you think make the best band names? <laughs> uh, I, I guess it's a music, so it's a music question. Makes sense. I uh, uh, I don't know. I always a wanted lot of to. Cards. I mean, a lot of them could work. I know. I always thought that uh, the flavor text of a version of Goblin Balloon Brigade is "Unleash the Toad." I always thought that would be that would be a good band name from a magic card. It feels like almost any magic card can be a band name. Yeah, maybe Hatred, maybe Stasis. <laughs> like I, I'm not. Uh, I guess I'm not into that much like that side of music. Like I, 
I could just like listen to it. I have the like music that I like and all that. But I, when it comes to like band names and and all that stuff, I I don't know as much. But I mean, look, I'm just I just have blue black control haphazardly open, but like hieroglyphic illumination. But that's <laughs> that like work. crazy. To me. I mean, like, at the same time, extraction <laughs> has <laughs> like, has a red of fervent would be a little weird or like Kiri yeah, Zev Skyship like, Raider. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like maybe, yeah, very spells specific names, like, like non-creatures. I think mo- a lot of non-creature spells would make good. Yes. Bet. Overwhelming splendor. That would fatal work. push. Cruel reality. Search for Ascanta. <laughs> like, oh, what? What is that? Is that like a? <laughs> it's like a Nordic, like, or maybe uh, I don't know. As well, Aztec. Yeah, I guess that'd be like an Aztec band. Yeah, I think most. Most non-creature spells could make a decent band name. I think they could. Yeah, Harness lightning, like, oh, what's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Um, <laughs> uh, Brigham Schellinger at Taskmaster 1995. I want to draft multiple times a week and not spend a ton. How would I go about that? Think Arena will help. Absolutely, I think Arena will help um, because it will likely be cheaper. Now, I don't know that for sure, but I have a feeling that with, you know, them kind of going into this space and exploring this kind of freemium uh, model that I do think they have to reduce the cost of playing the actual game. So I do think Arena will help uh, greatly in that regard. In terms of drafting multiple times a week and not spending a ton, I think really the only way to kind of minimize the cost of drafting is like winning drafts. I mean, I know, you know, a lot of stores will let you kind of build up a reserve of store credit you know i've done it uh quite a few times but i mean that's even on magic online you kind of have to go quote unquote infinite to not really spend a lot to continue to draft and i think that that part will mostly be true of arena as well like so probably the best thing you can do to draft a lot for cheap or free is to practice drafting and win as much as possible i mean even even like hearthstone i think which is on the freemium model i think you got to get like seven wins and you get your money back from doing an arena run so i think that that's like kind of your target is to get to the point where you're winning like 60 65 percent of your limited games and then whether it's magic online hearthstone arena your local game store then you're to the point where you're basically going to be drafting for free or close to free if you can get that good at limited Although, I mean, still, Arena will kind of smooth that out. I mean, it's only, I think, I don't have it in front of me, so I apologize. Uh, if, I think Hearthstone's like $2 to draft or something like that, or 150 coins. So yeah, $2. Either you can spend, it's $2. So if you, you can either spend two days grinding dailies, and you pretty much will have the 150 gold coins to draft, or you just spend $2. And I think that's a really much easier pill to swallow to spend two dollars a draft than fifteen every time. I'm sure that the upfront cost of Arena will be much cheaper than Magic Online. I think it'll be interesting. I think that Magic Online will be cheaper if you're good at limited because you won't be able to make money on Arena because nothing's tradable. When if you can win like sixty five percent of your games on Magic Online, you're actually like building a standard deck for free with your winnings from from playing Magic. Uh, from playing drafts, so, uh, but I think it will be a much lower cost to just jump into an event. I'm expecting it to be somewhere in the two to three dollar range. It's got to be there for them to make it work. Yeah. I think. So, and yeah, the cost might be more upfront, but I think drafting will always be fairly inexpensive on a platform like this. So I, you always have that kind of um, out and incentive to play. So like, I'm for someone like me who may just want to experience Hearthstone, I- I'm fine with just randomly paying $2 to draft Hearthstone, um, then maybe continuously playing Standard or something like that. So for this person that asked the question, if they just love drafting, then I think uh, Magic Arena will still be pretty inexpensive on all fronts. And I mean, depending on the actual numbers, you mentioned the freemium model. It's definitely possible that... If Magic Arena is similar to Hearthstone, you could grind your way into a couple of drafts a week or something without really paying anything if you're just willing yeah. to play enough other games to win those free drafts. Yep. A under slash guy at Canadian Canadian Syntax. I have a tibble. <laughs> and what are your <laughs> signing fees? <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, 
I sign cards for free if you'd like me to sign them. Uh, I just ask that you have a self-addressed envelope so I can send the card back to you easily. Uh, P.O. Box 110, Clyde, New York, 14433. So I check it every few days. So if you send me something there, I will get it and sign it for you. Just do the self-addressed stamped envelope thing. All right. Anthony at Quilted underscore Train. Will there be a Scoops Cunning Castaway in the next batch of Goldfish tokens? There Ooh. has to be. I mean, I think I pushed this card too much not to. <laughs> that is that is a good suggestion. <laughs> I'll try to add it to the token list. That that seems like a good one. Johnny at Goku023. Do you or can you track TCG inventory count and graph it much like you do prices? Future feature, perhaps. That's a really sweet feature, but that's also a Richard question. He's not here today, so yeah. uh, we'll add that to the Ask Richard list. But I like the idea. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, we'll definitely ask Richard. Um, Ronin Dark Rider at Ronin underscore Dark Rider. Uh, do you think it's possible to do something with Curse of the Cabal, Fury Charm, Dusk of Dust of Moments, and other suspend? So Chaz, what does Curse of the Cabal do? Oh man, uh, this <laughs> is <sighs> okay. I I know it's Planar Chaos. Uh, time Spiral actually, but close enough. Oh, Time Spiral. Damn. Uh, two and two black. I think it's suspend uh, three, suspend something. I don't know. All right. And I think like you sacrifice. It's like braids, to braids on like a suspend card. Okay. Like so you sack an artifact creature or land, something like that. Sort of. So ten mana. Oh, I got ten. Oh. Ten real mana. Jeez. You can suspend two for four mana. Target okay. player sacks half their permanents. He or she controls rounded down. Beginning each player's upkeep. If it's suspended, the player may sack a permanent to add two time counters to Curse of the Cabal. Okay. So, I think it's possible to to do something with it for, like, an Against the Odds style deck. But it is, even if you resolve it and make it come down really quickly... It doesn't even end the game. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of, especially with the rounded down part of it, if your opponent has, like, seven permanents, they're only going to sack three, it's kind of like only okay when you're doing all that work for it so i don't know i think you could build a fun casual deck not much hope that would actually take off or anything though yeah i i was close man that was i knew the card i know there was like a four on there but yeah <laughs> you had the, i don't you tend had to the remember right. this type of card. <laughs> yeah i know it did like sacrifice something but um uh shadow hawk again okay uh when will the site show prices for ixalan pre-release promos there's nothing there yet all right, so that's a Richard question. We will keep documenting. Here we go. So, Mean Mean Pork. Thought Seize is banned tomorrow. Is Modern better? I'm going to say no. Yeah, I don't I don't think so either. I think, like, I think it's actually a... It's kind it of the force worse. of will of, of Modern. It's, like, the easiest way, best way to keep degenerate combo decks in check. It, it sounds weird to compare it to Force of Will, but that's kind of how I see Thought Seize. Plus... You still got Inquisition, so banning Thought Seize, it's not like you're getting rid of that effect altogether. So I'm going to say no. Yeah. Oh, I, I missed another one by Shadowhawk again. Uh, do y'all think tokens can improve to have a better energy matchup? Strong showing at U.S. Nationals, but always bombed on camera. I have not played that matchup. Have you played any of the tokens decks, Chaz? Um, I have not. I... I I want to play the Abzan version, although I really like the Esper version. I, I think the Abzan list is a little better. Uh, just because, I mean, as much as I trashed on Vraska, sometimes it literally just can come down and win the game on its own. I don't know what you do. I think, you know, folks started talking about, oh, what was the Hour of, hour of Revelation? Yeah. The... Maybe an interesting like choice to start playing because you're actually the one that can push the creature limit and then you have like a three mana rat that's not bantu's last reckoning and it's also getting rid of and you can recover pretty quickly yeah you rec yeah hmm that's an interesting idea although it's a bit annoying that it hits like your hidden stockpiles and anointed processions yeah. and whatnot but it is an interesting idea i don't know i think i would have to play the the matchup a bit more to really know if there even is an answer energy is pretty good yeah. i don't know we'll have to see yeah that's a really good question but i think actually the esper version has I believe an easier time because um, you're just generating a lot more card advantage. You have Champion of Wits. You have the Cunning Castaway as much as you want to make fun of it. but um, <laughs> Scarab Gods. Scarab Gods. So, 
Um, we'll see. So Rock and Rainer at Rock and Rainer. I love to watch Magic coverage and play Limited. Can they ever be good together? How would you make it better? Hmm. So I think for me the biggest thing, the biggest thing they could do to make Limited better would be to get like Hearthstone style deckless overlays, preferably like interactive, so you could scroll over them and see the cards. I think for me, and I'm someone who knows Magic cards pretty well because that's what I do all day. Not knowing what's in a deck makes it much less exciting because when you're watching Constructed, you're seeing like, oh, they could draw this, they have this out, like, can they top deck it? But with Limited, it's just kind of this pile of random cards, you don't really know exactly what's in the deck, so I think somehow having the deck list easily accessible to viewers so they can kind of play along to some extent would go a long way towards improving Limited coverage. Yeah, I think so too, and the, the coverage for Limited has actually very much increased over the years, so... I think we're we're definitely getting there, but um, a few more suggestions, like you said, um, can certainly put it where it needs to be. I know a lot of people don't really like limited, but uh, it's an important part of Magic, and I, I think it still needs to continue to be on the highest you know level. Uh, but I mean, I know there's a lot of controversy that it doesn't need to be on the Pro Tour anymore. So, and if it's coming from the a lot of the Pro community, then I think we should start considering maybe it shouldn't be, but I've always liked limited and it helps, you know, a lot of people learn um, the format. So, you know, especially someone like me that doesn't draft as much, you know, over the years, I just never was really into drafting and never thought I was very good at it. Um, Watching the pros draft certainly has helped. So, but I mean, maybe that just sticks to content. And it definitely seems like almost a necessity to show off the new set. Like, Think of Ixalan and Worlds. Like, uh, if Pro Tour look like Worlds and you have, like, four Ixalan cards that are seeing play, that doesn't do a very good job of showing off Ixalan, but having limited rounds guarantees that you have these matches that it's just all Ixalan, and you're seeing all the cool cards, cards that will never show up in Constructed. So I think from Wizards' perspective, they feel like they need limited to show off the new set. Um, Cops, Stanislav... At KSV underscore KOP. Uh, Jay's Cunning Castaway made it at a standard PTQ. Should I sell them or is it better to wait for the Pro Tour? Uh, I think at this point you might as well wait, but they're like under 10 bucks at this point. So I don't really think they have that much more to to decrease. I mean, yeah, it well does wait. I mean, they might never take off, but you've seen like three mana planeswalkers in non masterpiece sets like Liliana, the last hope be super expensive. So if you look at like, I could lose $5 by waiting or gain $30 by waiting. It seems like it's a, a good risk to just hold on to them right now. Um, Matthew Baldwin at Baldwin man three. What would your dream pro tour finals decks can be anything. I know you like your jank. Uh, Panharmonicon. I'm in a route for Panharmonicon to make the finals of a pro tour until it rotates. That's my that's my dream. That's all I want. Then I can die happy. <laughs> I think it would really be awesome if someone uh, won with uh, Revel and Riches. That would be sweet too. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really awesome. Maybe both. Although I, I love tokens with... list, so I guess like my dream decks are like kind of happening already. I, I love, I've always loved token lists, like the aristocrat style list as well. I mean, I love my green as well. So maybe, I don't know, maybe dinosaurs, just tramples. That would be cool. Um, Mike Mackerel. <laughs> the underscore Mackerel. Why have Chaz and Richard been so negative on the podcast lately? No longer enjoy the episodes like I used to. I don't, so I'm too, I'm too nice. I'm not. I'm negative. I'm too negative. I, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like I'm the one that's mo- the most optimistic of the group. Every time I say something like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. It always feels like <laughs> you and Richard are the ones that are like, nah, it's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Richard How isn't is even here to all- defend himself. <laughs> Richard is not even here to defend himself, but I am. And I think that's I think that's baloney. I think that's pure baloney, Mike Mackerel. I, I do appreciate that I dodged uh, being named in that question. So thank you. It's thank you, Mike Mackerel. Me. <laughs> it's always me. I'm too, I'm too, I'm negative. I'm not negative. I'm too, like, optimistic. I don't, I'm not harsh enough. 
Like, I can't. It, it's too you, much. You just can't win, Chaz. You can't win. I can't. I really can't. It's 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 the worst. It's always me too. All right, uh, Patrick Thompson at PJ Thompson nine six six seven. Seth or all? Do you ever record gameplay videos not intending to post them just in case a brew ends up being sweet? Uh, yeah, I do that sometimes. I try to record as much as I possibly can because you never know when something sweet will happen. So. There are definitely times that I'm like, eh, I don't know if this deck's actually going to work out, but I might as well leave the recording running as I test it, just in case. I think that's get... all the fish mail. That was a lot. Whew, we got there. All right. Um, Seth, is there anything last second? <sighs> I think that just about, about does it. I think that just about does it, too. It was a lot of fish mail. Thank you, everyone, for sending those in. You can, Like I said, you can always send those in every single week. Yeah, that was fun reading. I don't usually get to read the, the fish mail. Yeah, hashtag them MTG fish mail on Twitter is the best way yes. to get them in. Yes. Anything crazy? Oh, yeah, like Scarab God's like 50 bucks. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can't go up anymore. I think we're at the nah, ceiling. I, I just I can't imagine I so. it going past 50. And it's weird because uh, it's like not even a four of usually. It's more of a like two to three of, and it's still <laughs> 50 bucks. It's, it's, it's doing some crazy stuff. Uh, luckily, that was in our <laughs> in our standard videos, Seth. Because uh, I mean, maybe even not, I mean, hostage takers still being seen play. So that was like pretty much the only thing we missed. Yeah, at this point. and I mean, Hazaret's up again too. Hazaret's up to like twenty again, uh, yeah, which is Hazaret. like I think about where it was when it spiked the pro tour. I think it's back up to its all time high now. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, and the other one is Anointed Procession. That's a card. Anointed Procession was the card when it came out. I was like, oh, that's that's a card that's going to be really expensive someday because of casual play. And now it's like ten dollars because it's all over standard. <laughs> I would I would have never guessed that Anointed Procession would be a competitive card, but it's super sweet that it is. It really is. Uh, Vraska is also seeing a lot more play than I originally intended it would. So that's my bad. Uh, I just didn't think like six men and those abilities would be that great, but. Apparently, it's really made a home in the uh, tokens list. It's kind of funny that Veraska, I think, has just completely beaten out Nicole Bolas as an expensive planeswalker of choice and standard. Yeah, like Ajani was another six mana one. Like it's definitely the expensive, more expensive Kermit Manicos walker that's seen play. And I'm really actually, I'm happy everyone's kind of catching on to Legion's Landing. That card is super good. Yeah, definitely strong. All right, Seth, uh, we will do this next week. Again, no Richard next week, so uh, that's going to be Seth and I signing off. That'll do it for this week. We will see you all next time. This is, well, two-thirds of the crew signing out.